and he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. Now, you know the saying is ignorance is bliss. And you know sometimes the easy way is to, you know, stick your head in the sand and just, you know, be oblivious to everything and act like everything's okay. Sometimes that's the easy way and, you know, that's you by nature, okay, but if it's not, you know, just you because of, you know, lack of courage or something, no good at all. And the thing says here uh, that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. And, you know, I like to try to at least partly keep my people informed. I don't, don't say that I'm that informed or that up on everything, but what I, a little bit I catch along the trail, I will keep you informed. I like to be informed. I like to know how things go, how things, you know, are going and how they go as far as the Word of God's concerned. And so I just have always taken that attitude and try to keep the people a little bit informed. And the reason for it is if you, you know, if you're just going to play the dum-dum and, you know, run from everything, then the next thing you got is, is troubles, and that doesn't work either. Go to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Look at verse 6. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for... Lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. All right, now the knowledge, look back at verse number one. You pretty well get it from verse number six there. Verse number one is real clear, the, especially knowledge along the lines of the Lord and the law of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God. There's the important thing. You know, people act like the Bible, well, you know, we take it, we leave it, we want it, we don't want it, and whatever, you know, it's our prerogative. Okay, going to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. The law of God, there's no knowledge of God in the land. It's important that you know the Lord, know how the Lord operates, know when you can count on the Lord, know what the Word of God has to say, otherwise you'd be destroyed. Now, in the millennium, and this be probably a tribulation application, in the millennium in Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 9, the Bible says, the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In the millennium, you have a situation where, oh, when that which is perfect is come, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, probably about verse number 9 or 10, in through there, uh, the context, actually, somebody says the Word of God. Okay, you've got the Word of God. Uh, but the context actually has to do with time against eternity. The context has to do with we know in part, and we prophesy in part, and you don't know things as well as you will one day. And the context is knowledge, and it speaks about perfect knowledge, and that has to do with the millennium. Now we see through a glass darkly, you know. Heaven's a place of understanding, earth is a place of trust. Uh, sometimes, you know, we just don't quite see clear enough. And sometimes won't see clear to the other side. Then shall we know, even as we also are known. It's important for you to have some knowledge, especially of the Lord, especially the word of God. Last part of verse number two, it says, And he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. Now, you had a warning along the same lines in Proverbs chapter one. And I understand the Proverbs one verse is quoted in Romans three. But Proverbs one verse 16 and 17 is a warning for you right off as far as your feet and as far as haste. 16, for their feet run to evil. If they got a chance to uh, get around something that's no good, bad situation, I mean, away they go. Their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood along those lines. And the Bible says, uh, somebody like that, uh, he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. I guess even the Bible, when you think of it, uh, you and I are supposed to even run the race with patience and not get in too big of a hurry. You might even be in the race for the Lord and get ahead of the Lord, excuse me, at times, and the Lord not even pleased with that. Take, for example, Peter, right before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there he was, I'm going to die for the Lord, and et cetera, and so on. What does he do? I mean, the Lord said, sell what you have and buy a sword. But Peter took that sword and got hasty with the sword. And man whips that thing out and knocks off a fellow's ear. What does he do? He sins. You know, sometimes people do the same thing with their feet. And sometimes just, you know, get in a hurry, won't wait on God. And before you know it, there's some problems involved. So it's true of Peter. It's true of the prophet in 1 Kings chapter 13, uh, who went back and he's called the disobedient prophet because the Bible says he was disobedient to the word of God. Started out right, just didn't retain 
uh, the right trail. And before you know it, somebody deceived him and uh, gets himself in a mess because of it. Verse number three, Proverbs 19 and verse number three. It says, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. It appears as though whenever somebody gets off, they're the ones that are to blame for the ver from the verse. It's the person's own foolishness that leads them astray. But it seems like people always want to push the blame somewhere else. And they'll, they'll blame other Christians. Uh, they'll blame sometimes even the Lord. Sometimes they even push the blame his way, according to the verse. And his heart fretteth against the Lord. Now, fretting is kind of, oh, it's like being, well, you say angry. Probably envious would be, well, I don't know if I'd be it or not, but some kind of close connections in Psalms and Proverbs. We'll say angry. It'll be somebody that gets kind of peeved, you know, and they even get that way. You can understand against you or I, but against the Lord, that doesn't really make much sense. But when somebody goes astray, sometimes they even get, or oh, they get aggravated at the Lord, get mad at God, seem like. And it's a situation where, oh, the Bible says, fret not thyself of, uh, because of evildoers, uh, because of him who prospereth in his way. And it looks like they're doing real well. So somebody get kind of aggravated, and they'll, they'll look like, uh, man, here's somebody making out better than I am. They're not even doing right. Uh, like David in Psalm 73, the problem was, uh, that upset him and caused him to fret uh, was that the ungodly prospered in the world and that had him all upset. Well, let me ask you this. You want to prosper in the world or the world to come? You got your choice. The ungodly, they can, they've got methods by which they prosper in this world. See? Okay, you can live for God and you may or may not prosper in this world. But listen, you'll definitely prosper on the other side. You'll never be sorry once you hit the other side. So you got a choice. And you know, if you see somebody that's not living right and making out well and that upsets you, you're not thinking straight. David said, I was tore up and I was tore up bad until I considered their end. And that's what you want to do. But just sometimes people, they fret a ungod the ungodly crowd and think they're having all the fun and they're doing so well and they're prospering. And sometimes they even get mad at the Lord. And it caused them to go further and further astray. Uh, take, for example, in the Bible, uh, take the situation here in Genesis chapter 4. What do you have? Abel offers a, well, Hebrew says a more excellent sacrifice uh, than his brother Cain. He offers that sacrifice and Cain could have done the same thing. Didn't do it. What did he do? I mean, his disposition fell, his countenance fell, and the fellow goes on and commits murder. Got all upset at the Lord. Why? I mean, the Lord saw what he was doing. The Lord knew that he was a hard-working man and all that kind of thing. The only thing is, when it comes to sacrifice for sin, it took blood. And the Lord paid no attention to anything else, no matter how hard the fellow worked. And his countenance fell. See? Problems. Uh, Taking the Bible, oh, for example, Jonah. Jonah was somebody else. What, what upset him? The thing upset him because, I mean... You know, Nineveh, an ungodly city, no good. They was repenting and God was honoring their repentance. You thought the fellow would rejoice, but he gets all upset. He begins to fret and he even got displeased with the Lord. In Jonah chapter number four, people are that way. Looks like the root of the matter in verse number three is a man's own foolishness. The foolishness of man perverteth his way. Don't go blaming somebody else. Don't go blaming some hypocrite, you know. Don't go blaming the Lord. Sometimes people do that. Uh, it's the perverseness of your own heart where the trouble is. All right, verse number four. Wealth maketh men of friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Now look at verse number six. Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. Now, you got a choice of how to get your friends. And what we talked about last time, I guess, and towards the end of chapter number 18 is you can gain friends by just staying by. And the thing says there, uh, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And somebody, you know, they just, they're your friend year after year after year after year after year. You just stick by. All right, chapter 17, somebody that gives a hand or helps out in adversity. 
when conditions are going against somebody and they're definitely adverse and somebody shows a favor or kindness that way, uh, you gain a friend that way. Pureness of heart in chapter number 22. You can do it that way or you can try to buy somebody's friendship. Now listen, Christian friend, don't go trying to buy friends all your life. There's people that do. There are Christians that do try to buy friends. You know what happens? You get out there somewhere along the line, you won't know who's your friend and who's not your friend. I mean, I know people that got buckos. And you know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of anybody even talks nice to them. Because anybody that talks nice to them might be just talking nice to them because they've got money. And, you know, sometimes people, people will do that. They definitely will do it according to verse number six and seven there. Six. And so you gain your friends the right way. And don't, don't try to buy friends. I've seen Christians try to buy friends. Don't do it. Don't even try to buy a girlfriend. I'm not saying be chintzy now. I'm not saying, you know, don't ever do anything for her. I'm not saying, uh, you know, don't ever take her on a date. You know, just nothing like that. I'm not saying, I'm just saying don't try to, to buy a girlfriend. Don't try to buy a Christian friend. Don't try to buy friends. Just be somebody that sticks by. When you give a hand, give a hand. You'll have a friend. You won't have to, you won't have to uh, do it like the world does it. Okay, uh, last part of the verse there says, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Now, if you buy your friends, eventually you're not going to know who they are for one thing. And eventually you might wind up like the prodigal. And the prodigal, you know, he wound up in the hog pen and he spent his substance, the Bible says. And I mean, he got what his daddy would give him there. And he spent his substance on riotous living. And when he had spent all, there was a famine in the land and he found himself out in the field and then he found himself in the hog pen and he found himself without friends. The old saying is when the money runs out, the fun runs out. P.S. So do the friends. And that was a case right there, a classic example of it. I mean, it looked real good for a while when finally the shekels were gone. Then there was no more friends anymore. No man gave unto him. In the paper, I think this past week, they talked about some Jew up in Minneapolis that took all the poor kids from downtown and put, threw a big party for them and gave, gave them 15,000 bicycles. I think it was something like that. Was, I mean, just tremendous, tremendous amount of bicycles. Now, you take that fellow. I don't know why he's trying to buy a friendship or what, but you reckon out of that kind of a thing, you think he's got any real friends? You think anybody he's given a bike to is stick by in adversity? You say, Probably. Oh, yeah, probably. But, you know, that's not the way you do it. Well, maketh many friends. That case, he, to some people in Minneapolis, he's still, you know, not much account. And others, you know, they think, well, yeah, he bought me a bike. But to have a real friend sticks by, no, that's not the way you do it. All right, look at verse number five here. A false witness should not be unpunished. Kind of a repeat there. Verse number nine is repeated especially for you to get the message. Uh, a false witness shall not escape. The thing says, or uh, speaketh lies shall not escape. And being this way, you know, whenever you tell a lie, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. False witness, lie. Uh, you're breaking commandment number nine. And payday comes for breaking uh, the Lord's, the Word of God and especially the commandments. Number six, many will entreat the favor of the prince. And every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. All I'd entreat is what? Taught you last time, uh, kind of beseech or beg somebody. Uh, in contrast with verse number 10, uh, it says, For a servant, last part of the verse, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. Now, a standard way would be that many would seek the princes or the ruler's favor, like in chapter 29, verse 26. But this particular case is reversed. Now, many will entreat the favor of the prince. They're looking uh, for the prince's favor. And if you're known for gifts, you don't even have to be a prince. They're going to still beg, and they're still going to seek your favor. But, you know, especially if you, along the lines of uh, somebody that's able to give, 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 and give some more, you're going, to have, you're going to have the crowd coming around. And it carries over into Christian circles as well. Number seven, now I won't go any further. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they're wanting to him. 
Now, shouldn't certainly shouldn't be true of Christians one with another. It'll be true of the lost folks, the, lo the lost crowd. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. It'll be a probably a, a general truth. You say all, but it wouldn't be like all without any exception whatsoever. There's some people who are lost and uh, they still will care about somebody along these lines, but make sure that you don't fall for it and in that you judge someone by what they have or what they have not. It wouldn't be that way. Uh, then the last part of the verse is that people don't uh, really make friends with them because they can't use them. There's, they don't have anything to offer. They've got nothing whatsoever. They don't have a, a thing that uh, can help anybody. They can't be used. Uh, they just don't have anything. And that poor one tries real hard to retain friends, to make friends, and yet uh, still just as scarce as can be. It looks like a, a very definite lack as far as friends because there's no way anybody can possibly use them. So I guess you and I need to be careful along those lines. You don't make friends for how you can use a person. Now, as far as a doctrine to be concern, concerned, Along the lines of the tribulation, you'd have rich and poor, middle class. That's America and days gone by, pretty well gone by. But in the tribulation, it's going to be rich or poor. And to be poor, for the most part then, would be a definite mark of uh, somebody who wouldn't take the mark. Can't buy, sell, or any way you can't hardly operate without taking the mark of the beast. And so they wind up being a poor person yet they really have the definite mark of being the real thing, someone to, you know, sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet friends, they don't have very many. Uh, here's somebody you might say, as far as tribulation, they're not too far from, well, being kings and priests over a kingdom or in a kingdom, millennium, within seven years of, you know, getting in on the real thing, suffering for the Lord and reigning with him, kings and priests. Yet the point in time where they don't have anything, man, you know, nobody make a friend to them. Better watch. You know, like the old saying is, watch who you uh, meet on the way up the ladder. You might meet them coming down. And you better watch who's down at the bottom. You might sometimes see a person like that at the top. Number eight, he that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. Now, verse number two implies that knowledge is very necessary. And uh, now to keep you balanced and so you don't just worship your brains, Lord places a lot of importance on wisdom, not just knowledge. Wisdom and understanding in verse number eight. As far as wisdom, many Christians, got you got to jump on the world. You should have. And in the fact that you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and in Christ Jesus lies all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you got to jump on the world. Uh, the Bible says he's made unto us wisdom Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So you ought to be able to fill the bill. Knowledge, verse 2, important. And now, verse number 8, both wisdom and understanding and attention is called to them. But verse number 9, a false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. You know something? According to the last part of verse 9, lying is enough to send a person to hell. You know, the world's got the idea, you know, it's murder, it's adultery, it's uh, fornication, that type of thing. Well, not fornication, not hardly even adultery anymore. Uh, but the world has the idea that, uh, you know, it's just, you know, a couple or three things. And in the Bible, it says, he that speaketh lies, you got it? Lies shall perish. And that's a statement that somebody is just, if they don't, they never commit adultery in their life. They never commit murder in their life. They pay all the taxes. They're just a liar. There's somebody right there that's headed for hell until they get that sin or those sins forgiven. Number 10, delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. All right, now take your Bible and look at, uh, oh, look at Ecclesiastes 10. Look at verse 6 and 7. Ecclesiastes 10, 6. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I've seen servants upon horses. Something's backward. Servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. You know what it amounts to? Verse 6 says it's folly, a foolishness. Something's wrong. Something's not right. Uh, 
That thing in seven, servants upon horses and princes doing the walking. A foolishness. Now, somebody told me, I saw a picture of somebody. I, to me, you know, I called him Mr. Lips. Now, I think the title was Mr. I don't know, RST or some kind of thing like that. But the ugliest thing I ever saw in my life. And someone said, hey, the president's wife, Nancy Reagan, kissed that guy. I said, what? I couldn't believe it. Oh, well, she kissed him on the forehead. And you talk about a joke, man. The fellow turned around and he, she kissed him, Mr. T U V or whatever his name is, or R S T. She kissed that dude, and he turned around and and uh, is supporting Jesse Jackson, a Democrat. <laughs> you imagine that? Boy, I tell you. He said, well, what do you expect, Brother Martin? Nothing. <laughs> you put Hollywood in Washington, I don't expect anything. I expect Hollywood. That's Hollywood, see? That's just Hollywood. They just live in Washington. That's Hollywood, see? Black and white, you know, mix them all together. and Boy, oh boy. In the Bible, that's exactly backwards once again. And the thing says there, for a servant to have rule over princes. You say, well, he's not ruling. Yeah, but for her to do that, that's definitely backwards. Eleven, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Now, it doesn't say you're not to be angry. New Testament says be angry and sin not. But you need to keep you cool and be real careful when you do get angry and keep it under control. Deferreth his anger to be along the lines of long-suffering. And you know what anger does it? When it speaks, it speaks like a dragon speaks, like a flash of fire. And so you're best to let her cool, you know, and simmer down and make sure things under control and hold still for all day. That'd be a safe way. Hour might do it, but I'll give it a day, you know, defer your anger. I'll show that you're long suffering. And Bible says that uh, it's just discreet to do that. It's very wise to do that. And discretion will wait and get everything weighed out before before it draws a final conclusion. And, you know, because most of the time we get angry too quick, too easy, and over something really not all that important or something that's not, uh, not as correct as what we sometimes think it is. Uh, I read where a fellow said instant vengeance is great to the natural man. In fact, I've said it. <laughs> instant vengeance is great to the natural man and the flesh. But it make a mess of things and do a lot of damage and be sorry for for a long time. And the passage here, the greatest glory, last part of the verse, the greatest glory somebody can never get, is to make as little and light as you can over a transgression and just keep yourself clean and, and don't stoop down to the degree someone else will stoop to. And it's his glory to pass over a transgression. Sometime you'll be done wrong and sometime I'll be done wrong and, and just pass it over. And it's a glory to a person to be able to do it. It shows they've got some solid Christian character and able to control themselves that much. Uh, you take David, for example, a couple situations there with Saul. You thought, man, if, it, if anybody deserved it, he deserved to have his, not as just his skirt cut off, his head chopped off. And you thought, man, David would cast in. And two times, 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 26, both times he passed over the transgression. Gave Saul a couple chances at most people never do. And you know what that, that was? That's a glory to David. He might have blown it some other ways. Along those lines, he had it right. Discretion of man deferreth his anger. It's his glory to pass over a transgression. Verse number 12. All right, the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but its favor is as dew upon the grass. What do you have? Technically, you got, well, you got a situation that the king would be the Lord. That would be the millennium. Second advent. Uh thing says is as the roaring of a lion. You might mark down Jeremiah 25, verse number 30. You might mark down Isaiah 42, verse number 13. And last part, of course, now I'd take you on into the millennium there. His favor is as dew upon the grass. 
It'll be like under the latter rain, early and latter rain, that Joel speaks about in Joel chapter number 2. Okay, I'll stop in verse number 12 there, in Proverbs chapter number 19. Father, we thank you now for the word of God and ask your blessings upon what's been spoken and may you sanctify it, Lord, by your spirit and may what's been said that be a blessing to somebody, may it stick. Lord, something not exactly right. Lord, I pray you just scratch it, Lord, and from their memory and from their heart, Lord, and may the word of God, the pure word of God itself still stand and do what needs to be done. Lord, we ask for safety as we go to our homes. I ask you, Lord, to keep each one safe, those that travel across the town and uh, even a little bit further than that, Lord, I ask for safety and even those nearby. Lord, bless the families of lost loved ones. And I pray for uh, Glenda's family, Lord. I ask that you'd help there and get something accomplished, Lord, in the hearts of some of those people. And for the aunt that's been sick, Lord, she'd be well enough to go to the dad's funeral. Pray for Jim Lake as he preaches his mother's funeral tomorrow. Lord, just ask that you'd give uh, great courage, Lord, and, and help to say what needs said to his own family. And bless them abundantly and encourage the hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As far as I know, uh, the church business, everything I know about it, everything I know about the revival, what Brother MacDowell said and all that kind of stuff there, uh, I think everything's in order. The Lord gave us a real, real good revival. Seem like the meetings go better at the first of the year than they do even in the summertime. Now, I'd say we don't have good meetings, but it seems like summertime, folks have just a little something to do enough to distract their attention to miss some of the meetings. And in the wintertime, there's nothing to do. What can you do tonight? So you come to prayer meeting because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> you might come because you want to, I guess. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we've had really, really good meetings at the first of the year. So plan to have Brother MacDowell in. Uh, be the second week, second week of Timkin's vacation. And I told him uh, to catch the second week of July for a tent meeting and save that week for us, which we've had a four, I think it's make the fifth straight year uh, for the tent meeting. And then in between that time, I'll probably get you another a couple more, at least weekend meetings scheduled and uh, maybe have Brother Sam Gipp. I think I might give him a call one of these days and uh, get a hold of Brother Sam and see sometime if he knows when he's going to be coming to this area, if it'd be possible to get him in for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, Brother Wayne Mund, I understand he's dealing with about a year recuperation, but I don't, that's just what Miss MacDowell heard, and I don't know that firsthand. But maybe towards the if fall time, sometime, we can get Brother Wayne Munn to come for either five days or three days. And uh, there's, there's lots of good fellows out there. And I'm going to try to shoot several of them your way this year. I got a good start now, Brother MacDowell. And spirit seems real good this evening. And we'll try to have a real good, strong spirit and good services come this Sunday and keep it rolling good and strong for the winter time. All right, now we're in Proverbs chapter number 19. In Proverbs chapter number 19, you're dealing with all some things in relation to Christian character and humility, uh, very much needed. And uh, so we're at verse number 12. I think last time I dealt somewhat with number 12, of Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19 and verse 12, now it says, The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. All right, now, as far as I'm concerned, what you'd want to look at, as far as verse number 12 is concerned, I'd want to look at it from a doctrinal standpoint. I understand most of what I give you from Proverbs is it's going to be practical. If I would look at the Proverbs 19, verse 12, I'd want to look at it from a doctrinal standpoint. And of course, that would be the first part of the verse would be dealing with or be dealing with the second coming, really. Uh, it speaks about the king. That will be Jesus at the second coming, uh, Revelation chapter 19. It speaks about the king's wrath and a the connection there that's similar to there has to do with the lion. And, you know, when he comes back, he comes back, and uh, the Bible says, A great day of his wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? In Revelation chapter number 14. All right. Uh, also, when he comes back, he's likened unto a lion. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you can understand what you got in the first part of the verse. From a doctrinal standpoint, you're dealing with the tribulation, or right at the very end, right when Jesus comes back. All right, the last part of the verse take you on into the millennium. It says, but his favor is as the dew upon the grass. So if I was going to deal with the verse, well, that's pretty well how I would deal with the tribulation or second advent and then the millennium as far as his favor is concerned. All right, now let's take and go a little bit in the Bible and sort of check things out. Look at chapter 20 look at verse number 2. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. All right, now the same thing you read back there in chapter number 19. 
And when Jesus Christ comes back the second time, you can be sure uh, people make a lot of statements now, a lot of wild statements. They curse his name, blaspheme his name. You can be sure when he comes back the second time, uh, people that don't know anything about the fear of God,